thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tom Hoyland. I'm an Agile delivery lead at Sky Betting and Gaming, and today I'm going to be presenting you with a case study. I'm going to be talking to you about how we've been able to build what we consider to be a high-performing Agile team with a DevOps culture at its heart. To do that, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to talk to you about how this team came together, the tools and techniques that we used, the metrics that we followed, and the lessons that we learned along the way. So, let's begin. Let's start this. Once upon a time, there was the world of sky betting and gaming. Now, we're a big company. We've got over 1,500 people, and we structure ourselves based around squads and tribes. Now, two years ago, one of our tribes, the core tribe, decided to restructure itself, and it created a number of new teams. And one of those teams was the login and registration squad. And this was a team that I joined. Now, this was charged with two responsibilities. The first one, to enable all of our customers to be able to register safely across all of our products. And the second one, to enable our customers to be able to log in safely and securely, even during the highest throughput days of the year. Days like Grand National, the Cheltenham Festival, and on Boxing Day, where we see some absolutely monumental traffic volumes. Now, login and registration is going to be the setting for our story today. In fact, it's going to be the main character. So I'm going to introduce you to its acronym counterpart. I'd like you to meet Lars. Lars was created when 12 people came together, enthusiastic graduates straight out of university and some engineering veterans. And when we came together, so much had changed. So we decided to have a squad inception to work out what we wanted to be as a team. So we went away and we came up with three goals and ambitions. And these were them. The first one was this. We wanted to be the best login squad thingy ever. Naturally, we wanted to be a great team and support our customers. We also wanted to be the most agilest squad ever. We wanted to be able to sense and respond to our customers' needs, to be able to iterate and get towards continuous delivery. And because some of us had been reading the Phoenix Project, naturally, we said we wanted to be maximum DevOps. And that's not a typo. We just didn't understand what a DevOps culture and mindset was back then. But we knew we didn't just want to create products. We wanted to optimize, to iterate them, and operate them throughout their lifespan. So what do we decide to do next? Well, we decided to do one important thing, and that is to do nothing. Because so much had changed already, but in the background, we were doing something. We were baselining where we were as a team. We were looking at how the team was operating and starting to collect metrics, and using this information to help guide us on our journey towards maturity. Now, to help us to develop our maturity in the DevOps space, we needed some help from our friends. So we looked at other frameworks and patterns that exist. When I talk about frameworks and patterns, I mean things like Scrum and Kanban. Frameworks are amazing things. They enable us to take content and expertise in one context, make it portable, and deploy it in another. And it's up to us as practitioners to decide whether to use that or to cast it to one side. Now, to help us on our journey, we look towards probably one of the most popular frameworks that exist within the DevOps space. We look towards CALMS. CALMS was a great starting point for us. It helped us to focus on the key areas that matter. Now, we could have started by automating all of the things. We could have started by focusing on our culture, but we decided to continue on with gathering metrics to understand how our team was working. So we started to gather metrics. We captured the health of our endpoints. We started to look at the availability of our services. And then we decided to expand those metrics out to not just focus on the technology, but the product. And then we expanded it further to focus on everything that moved through our pipeline. If somebody touched it, we start to put a metric around it. And we captured so many metrics. The complexity of our work, the capex, opex balance, because people care about financial metrics, incidents, changes, even, even the health of our squad. But we decided to do one interesting thing with all of this information. We decided to hide it from our team. So why would we choose to hide all of this information? Surely, if we want to be the most agile team, we believe in things like empiricism, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. Why hide this? Well, we know that when we're being watched, we naturally start to change our behavior. It's called the observer effect. It's also called the Hawthorne effect. And when we become aware of metrics being placed around us, we can't help but change our behavior. Now, some metrics help us. They take us in the direction that we want to go. They help us with our long-term goals and aspirations. But some metrics are vanity metrics. They can lead to some really perverse short-term behaviors. So we chose to hold our metrics back, but to reveal them to our team on a case-by-case -case basis so they could choose whether to use them or to cast them to one side. This was all about giving them informed consent. So where do we go from here then? 
We've started to capture all of these metrics. Well, we go back to basics. One of our goals was that we wanted to be the most agile squads. And really good high-performing agile teams are not afraid to go back to basics. And a good team starts with a backlog, a backlog that everybody can work to and center around and collaborate on. But we didn't have that when we started. So we started to assemble our backlog. And we started to look at all the work that was taking place. We saw everything that was happening now, all the things that were happening next, all the things that had been before. And we started to classify things. We saw the usual suspects. We saw features, bugs, incidents, defects, security vulnerabilities. We collected all of these things together. And everything seemed to follow the same pattern, the same workflow. And we thought we had it all worked out. But that was until we started to see some of our features beha behaving very differently to others. The first kind of feature that we saw started as a little seed of an idea, a little embryo. This seed would grow. It would be nurtured. Information would be added. Things would be taken away as part of ideation. But then it would land on the delivery doorstep of our pipeline and be converted from concept into reality. And that didn't trouble us. But then we started to see some features appear as if from nowhere, appear from a, from a puff of smoke. They had the same level of integrity. They landed on the delivery doorstep of our pipeline but they had none of the history, none of the legacy. You couldn't see where, where it had come from. And what this led us to believe was that maybe we have multiple product backlogs at work here. Maybe we have multiple ingress points coming into our team. So we decided to go on a product backlog hunt. And we found backlogs in all the usual places. We found them in Jira, in Trello, naturally in, X, in Excel. And then we also found backlogs specific to professions, UX backlogs, security backlogs, and everybody's favorites, the enterprise wiki where everything goes to die. <laughs> so what we decided to do was to funnel all of these backlog items into a single location. And the size of our backlog jumped up. It jumped up by 130% virtually overnight. Now, can you imagine how our product owner reacted to that increase? Absolutely right. What they meant was, which thing first? <laughs> because for the first time, Everything was in one place. Yes, we created a monstrous backlog, but now we can see that monster. We can confront it, and we can have higher quality conversations about what is the highest priority thing to do next. It can drive our conversations. What it also enabled us to do is to change the nature of who owned that product backlog. It used to be the domain of our product owner, but now because we've got that dev work in there, UX, security, vulnerabilities, it's suddenly the team's backlog. The team is suddenly more inclined to have conversations about it and canvas for their things moving up the priority list. It was a great place to get to. It improved the quality of our conversation at a team level. But the word that I'm using here is wrong. The word I'm using here is priority. The real word I should be using here is value, because the things at the top of our product backlog when executed should deliver the maximum business value. But back then, we were not mature enough to be able to talk in terms of value. But we will be coming back to this later and refactoring this conversation. This was all about taking our team back to basics, the basics of empiricism, consolidating everything, giving people visibility, and then doing something with that information, changing what we work on and how we work. The second thing we decided to do was to take this same principle and apply it to our people as well. Aggregate all of that knowledge and experience that we've got together with these 12 team members that we've got. Yes? No. Because you can't aggregate experience. You can't add it up arithmetically. Experience is not homogeneous because when you bring teams together, even though people may be using the same language, the same terms, the same phrases, the same words, they mean very different things. They've got different worldviews different experiences, different understandings. Even though we use the same words, we are very definitely speaking a different language. The second thing that we found that was when our team came together, they didn't just come alone. They were influenced by people in their past, trainers, instructors, and gurus. And what we found is that when our team came together, we had a case of guru one-upmanship, where people would say that my guru is more effective than your guru. And this is no basis from which to start and create a high-performing team. So we decided to take our team back to basics once more. And we did this through an agile boot camp format. This is bringing an entire team together in an intensive training course for a single day, putting everybody in the same room and going back to basics on what is agile, looking at extreme programming principles, collective code ownership, whole team decision-making, paired working, paired programming, looking at the mathematics of how we move towards continuous delivery, Conway's law, Little's law, queuing theory, 
and providing psychological safety and the implications of psychological safety. And the goal here was to provide our team with an entire soup of options that they could pick and choose from and align on. Enter the room as individuals, but leave the room as a collective team, agreeing and defining their own version of Agile. This was all about synchronization and alignment. The second thing that we did was we bootstrapped the growth of our team's culture. We wanted to accelerate it. So we did that using rules and values. What are rules and values? Rules are the hard red lines that a team sets for itself. They are the constraints, they are the guardrails that a team puts in place. They are agreed and defined by that team. But it's about enforcing them. And in our case, there's going to be a penalty if you break some of these rules. And that's usually cake on a Monday. And I've had to pay that price. Values, though, values are different to rules. If rules are digital, then values are analog. Values you can turn up, you can turn down based on the context in which you're working. And it's up to the team to decide how to apply these things. And using these rules and values, what we were able to do was to start to develop our team's culture. Now, this culture started off very quiet. It was very quietly spoken very inwardly looking, very covert. But over time, as the team became more confident in itself, the culture became louder. It became more overt. It became the identity for the team. So what do you do for a team that has a very strong identity? You give them something physical, a physical manifestation, a physical metaphor to bring that team together. So he gave them a flag. <laughs> Flags are incredibly powerful things. They signal to the rest of the organization that we've got a distinct group of people here. And they make that group feel that they're part of something bigger. This is all about building a culture. And culture is one of the key parts of the CALMS framework. A strong culture enables a team to grow and to scale and at the same time remain resilient. What it also enables a team to do is to shrink and contract, but at the same time remain strong. Culture is the ultimate anti-fragility pattern if we want to build high-performing teams. And that doesn't matter if we're in the DevOps space, the Agile space, or any other space. And this all sounds fantastic, but at Sky Betting and Gaming, there's a lot of work to do. And we can't spend all of our time working on metrics and culture. Because in 2018, so many things were taking place. We had GDPR. We had regulatory change. We had a small football match in Russia called the World Cup to deal with. And so, there's one question that follows you around, and it doesn't matter what industry you're working in, it's this, how long is something going to take? People care about time to market, they care about time to impact. Time is an investment-based decision. So it's important that we're able to answer that. And people are asking us, how long is it going to take to deliver something? And we are a new team that's come together. So to answer this question, we zoomed into our team at a microscopic level to understand what interactions were taking place. We looked at the work, and we looked at the people. And this is what we found. We found that our work fell into one of two different categories. We named these categories, and these are just arbitrary names. The first category was what we call commodity-based work. This is work that lives within an existing domain. When I talk about domains, I mean domain-driven design, ubiquitous language, and a bounded context. And it's based on a known technology, the technology that we understand the physics behind. Bespoke-based work is slightly different. This is based on a new domain, something we haven't yet fleshed out, something that we are yet to fully understand. And it's based on existing and new technologies. What we also found was that these two different types of work actually lived in two different thought spaces. We can apply them to a Kinefin framework. We can see that bespoke-based work tends to live within the complex zone, and commodity-based work tends to live within the simplistic zone. But regardless of all of these differences, we found that they shared one thing in common, that it doesn't matter how many people that you throw at them, eventually you start to hit the physics and the limits of that technology. Even though technology is there to set us free, ultimately it starts to constrain us, it starts to slow us down. You can only parallelize so much, you can only pair up so much before you start to hit the law of diminishing returns. So we started to understand how our technology constrained us. The second thing that we found was that our people were amazing. The team that we had was incredibly enthusiastic. Everybody was helping everybody else out. People would review each other's PRs, check each other's work. It was a great thing to see. We were very much a T-shaped team. But what we found 
is that we had a huge amount of variability. Remember, we've got 12 people in this team, that is 12 nodes in that network, and that is a huge amount of context switching and variability. And all of these things added together makes it really difficult to be able to provide an estimate or a forecast that we've got a high degree of confidence in. So what we decided to do was to go back to basics once more, and we said to our team, we want you to organize yourselves into two groups. We're going to split you. We're going to create a group of six, and we're going to create another group of six. And we effectively halved the team. And by doing that, we're able to reduce the amount of variability. We took the nodes in the network down from 12 down to six. This enabled us to increase the amount of focus that we had, reduce the amount of context switching, reduce the amount of variability. From a, at a personal level, what it also enabled us to do was to improve the amount of focus that people had. Senior members of the team were able to spend more time working with more junior members of the team, coaching and mentoring them. It was incredibly rewarding. For the more junior members of the team, they were able to focus on a specific technology area and start to understand it and appreciate it as they were new to the organization. It was really good for them. But what this enabled us to do by applying these artificial constraints was, it was we were able to stabilize our throughput. After about four time boxes, or about eight weeks as we call them, we started to see stability in the throughput for both of these two different work streams that we created, bespoke and commodity. And this stability enabled us to go back to the wider organization very quickly and say with a high degree of confidence, we think it's going to take us between X and Y to be able to deliver this. And it was a good place to get to. But because we've got this time-based concept now, we can go back to our existing conversations and we can refactor them. We can no longer talk about priority. We can talk about value because we have the missing part of that equation. And we can now talk about why those things at the top of our backlog deliver the maximum business value. So let's go back to those metrics, all those things that we were capturing. We were interested in two things. We wanted to improve the quality of what we were doing. That's why we encourage things like paired programming, shifting where quality takes place, moving it from being post-process to being in-process. And we were interested in things like increasing our stability. So we exposed two metrics, well, four metrics. The complexity of, of the throughput of our team and the capacity of the team at any one point in time. And we also exposed the number of defects and the number of incidents so we could see the effects of paired programming and paired working on the quality of our work. So, where do we go from here? Team said they've had enough. After three months, we've done way too much with this team. They've hit saturation point. We've embedded too many practices and too many policies. And this was a really good thing because for the first time, our team turned around to us and they said, actually, we need to slow down. But they came back to us with a single voice. And this showed us that our team's culture was starting to form. They had a single identity. So we took our team back to basics and we decided to start making the, the things that are invisible visible. Now, we're a Kanban team. Kanban works for us. It works with the volatility of the work that we're dealing with. And one of the key principles behind Kanban is visualization, visualizing everything relentlessly. So that is exactly what we decided to do. We visualized everything so we could crystallize how we were working and embed those things, those policies, those processes, and ways of working in our team. So we visualized things. If it moved, if you touched it, if it even hinted at moving, we started to visualize it, no matter how small it was. And then we started to visualize all of the things that were not even software engineering related, risk assessment, pen tests, even meetings, engagement with the wider organization, everything we started to visualize. And what this revealed was that we were doing a lot more than we thought we were. And we'll come back to metrics later. What we also did was we started to visualize all the things that didn't move. We visualized our policies, our processes, our pipelines, and our blockages. And what this enabled us to do was to see everything. It improved our observability of everything that we were doing. It revealed where the kinks were in our pipeline, the obvious ones and the subtle ones. And I'm not going to give a prize out to the person that can guess where the bottleneck's going to be. If you've got a team, and it's pretty heavy in software engineers, you've got one business analyst and two testers, you can guess where those cues are going to start to form in analysis and test. So we decided to do something about this, but we didn't want to add more people to the team. We didn't want to take people away. We wanted to see how we could deal with this challenge ourselves as human beings. So we decided to look at the frameworks that exist. We went, decided to look at Scrum. Now, just because we're a Kanban team doesn't mean that we can't use Scrum. And one of the best things that Scrum did, and it's the reason why eight out of 10 cats prefer Scrum, 
is it changed the language by which we refer to teams. What Scrum did is it took away job titles. We did, we, we did away with business analysts and software engineers, UX architects, and we created this concept of the development team. This was about shifting the focus away from the individual to the wider team. The real measuring stick, the real way that we measure the impact of a team is not by the, the individual and their contribution, by what that team can do together. It's about the products and services that we create. And so what we started to do is to really coach into our team, to not bring your job title to the team, click, but also bring yourself. Bring your skills, bring your experience, bring your personality, because all of these things together are far more important. Don't consign yourself to a single role. You're part of a team. Your real measure of success is what impact that team can have. And so we started to encourage this and coach it within our team. And what we started to see was that when we encountered blockages and constraints in our pipelines, people were able to hop from one thing to another. We had devs testing. We had devs doing business analysis work. We had ops helping out with our business analysts. Everybody was moving around across different professions. And what this enabled us to do was it enabled us to relax those constraints in our pipelines. We were able to increase our team's throughput. But what we were also able to do was increase our team's empathy. Because if we're working in a role, in somebody else's role, very quickly you start to appreciate why that person cares so much and so passionately about the things that they do. And what this enabled us to do was to change how we reacted to key events that took place. Now, it used to be the case that when our test environment went down as part of our pipeline, ops and test would panic. They would run around. But now, because it's everybody's responsibility, everybody panics. <laughs> because it's everybody's responsibility to restore service. And you know what? It's not all just about the empathy, because we saw some fantastic metrics here. By moving people around, we saw a 30% increase in our pipeline's throughput. That's 30% more work moving through our pipe. We visualized everything aggressively. And you know what we saw? We saw a 230% increase in the amount of work that was taking place. That work was always happening. It's just that we didn't have visibility of it. And by pairing up, by working more closely with each other, we saw a reduction in defects and vulnerabilities. They went down by about 30%. But the stats aren't all good because one of the key stats here is cycle time. And cycle time hopped up. It went up from five days up to seven days. And this made us sad. But the reality was it had always been seven days. But now we know that. We can do something about it. This is all about increased observability, increased visibility. Now, these metrics sound really good. They paint a really good picture. But I'm afraid they're all vanity metrics. They don't actually tell you what's going off in a team. They are just an expression of what's happening. They are just the surface. What's really going off is beneath the surface. If we want to make a car go faster, we don't start by moving the speedo up and down. We actually focus on the engine. It's the people, it's the interactions, it's their drive, it's their motivation. That is the real engine room for a team. And we found out that this was the thing that was driving our team forward. We found that the key thing in our team were its values. This was the engine room. This was the thing that enabled our team to respond in the way that it was. Our values were our real metrics, and these were the things that we really believed in. And so, what we decided to do was we decided to graph them. But before we did, we noticed something really interesting. Now, right back at the beginning, I told you about Lars, the login and registration squad. But it turned out that after maybe about six months to a year, Lars was no longer about login and registration. Lars had actually broken free from those products. It had become a culture. It had become a mindset. This was incredibly powerful. So we decided to measure it. We went back to our metrics and we started to expose our team's health and values. And every week we started to ask questions about how do you feel? What's your sentiment? What things are we focusing on that we should do? We asked six questions. Do you feel focused? Do you have a strong business awareness? Is the word that's moving through our pipeline of the right size? And do you feel that your voice is heard? Do you have time to collaborate and listen to your colleagues? And what we decided to do was we decided to graph it, look for the trends, look for the dips, the key events that have taken place, and to use this information to change the way that we communicate and to change the things that we focus on. This is incredibly powerful. 
So, how do you make all of this stick then? We've got a better way of working. We're building better products. We've got a happier team. Well, to make something stick, you use repetition. You build muscle memory, you build discipline. And that is exactly what we did. And we started to follow the Shuhari learning cycle. Shuhari comes from martial arts. It's made up of three key stages. The first one is Shu. Shu is all about building muscle memory through repetition and building discipline. The second phase is Ha. Ha is all about understanding the interconnectedness between things, the physics, and then with that knowledge, starting to bend rules. And then we've got Re. Re is the final stage, and it's about redefining the way that we work to achieve the same outcomes, but with far more sublime methods. So we decided to follow this. But we weren't in the second phase, we weren't in the third phase, we were definitely in the first phase. So we decided to build that discipline. So we took our team to the gym. And we did that by pumping up the volume of our user stories. We took our user stories and we made them incredibly thin. Not just salami sliced thin, but sashimi sliced thin. Incredibly thinly. We started to break good practice. Good practice like things like invest. And what we started to do is increase the numbers by about 40%. This is a 40% pumped up inflation. But we're doing this for a reason. Because we want to build muscle memory. By doing something time and time again, you build discipline within a team. You test the robustness of your policies. What you also do is you expose those blockages. If you do something once or twice per day, you quickly forget about the things that hold you back, the things that slow you down. If you do something 10, 20, 30 times per day, that pain is going to become so acute that you can't help but do something about it. And that is exactly what we did. Because after going through this period of slicing things incredibly thinly, we started to bring things back together. We tested our pipeline. We improved the robustness and the resilience of our pipeline. And we built in these new ways of working. And we saw our cycle time come down. It went down from seven days down to two days, which was a really good achievement. So where do we go from here then? Well, you never settle. An agile organization is only as agile as its least agile team. Let's just have a quick show of hands. Who feels that this is the case in an organization that you work at or you've worked in? OK. OK. Now, when work comes to us as Lars, it turns out that it does not originate from Lars. The world does not begin and end there. It comes from the wider organization, from sky betting and gaming. And we started to look at the work that came to us, and we found that this work was really large. It wasn't very malleable. It was very output focused. It didn't help us in getting towards continuous delivery. So what we decided to do was not just to optimize ourselves, but to optimize the entire value chain, upstream and downstream. And so we started to shift left in how we were thinking about things. We started to coach the wider organization. Because if we want to go faster as a collective, we need to help everybody else out. We shifted left on our agile coaching too. The agile boot camps that I talked to you about, we expanded them to the wider organization. We trained over 100 people. And what this enabled us to do was to change the size of the work that was landing with us. It became smaller. It became more malleable. We could move towards continuous delivery more effectively. But to get things out of the door, You've got to go through service management and operations. And service management and operations sometimes may feel a bit arcane. It may feel a bit old school. After all, we've been doing continuous delivery. It sometimes feels a bit like a waterfall at the end of a river, where water goes over the side of a cliff, because it's a stage gate. But an acceptance into service, which is part of putting any new service live at Sky Betting and Gaming, is incredibly important. It's about. It's about increasing the confidence in that product, preparing that product for use by real customers, protecting our customers. It's there for operational re operationally resilient reasons. But work does not behave like a waterfall. No, work blasts out of the ground like a geezer. Because when we went to our acceptance into service meetings, loads of additional backlog items, extra work, operational security work, were suddenly re revealed at the last moment. And our key measurement for this was the length of time it took to complete an acceptance into service. All those people together in one room. It took us two hours to go through that process. And that is two hours elaborating conversations that had previously been missed. 
So what we decided to do was to make ops, security, service management a first class citizen, pull all of these things back into our product backlog, make everything visible. What we also decided to do was to expand the engagement that we had with the organisation, expand it not just to our service and ops teams, but to the entire organisation too. And we did this through war games. War games is a fantastic format for bringing an entire organisation together, and that's exactly what we did. We brought security, we brought our contact centre, fraud, risk, legal, our service operations teams all together into a single room to enable them to understand the service that they were building, to test its robustness, not just the technology, but the service and the product, the things that our customers see. And so, this enabled us to not just see that a product was related to the software that we build, but it's actually how we operate it going forward. A product is not just the functionality we create, it's the ops, it's the contact center, it's all of this spectrum that we have to take into account. This represented Lars moving away from just building products and being a product-oriented team to becoming a DevOps team. We're operating the products, we're considering service management and security. And the real litmus test for the effectiveness of this was how long it took us to complete an acceptance into service. Before it took us two hours, now we got it down to 12 minutes because all of these things are made visible. Over the last 18 months, we've done so much with the team. We've got better at breaking work down. We've got paired working, paired programming. We've got a strong culture and an identity. We've lowered our cycle time. We've got salami sliced user stories, sashimi sliced user stories, and we've got a happiness index, a way to monitor the health and the sentiment of our team. And all of these things have come together. They've grown together to enable us to move forward and to change the language that we use. It used to be the case that we talked about team performance in terms of velocity. But velocity is just another agile vanity metric. One week it will be up. I guarantee you the next week it will have changed. Our focus now is on two key metrics. The first one is our team's health. This is the weather vane. This is the thing that is going to show you the effects of what's going to happen in the next week, the next month. And it enables you to take proactive action to correct these things before they start to show up in those vanity metrics. The second thing that we did was we started to take all of that knowledge, all of that data, all of that information that we've been creating and collecting and piece it together and start to forecast forward. And so we started to use performance corridors. We looked at what the team was behaving like on a good day and a bad day. And then we said, as long as you remain within these two boundaries, you're OK. And this was incredibly powerful. This was about incremental gains, incrementally finding a way to deliver better products and operate our services in a better way. And this takes me back to a great definition of what Agile is, and it comes from Dan North. Dan North said this, Agile is about sustainably reducing the lead time to business impact. And that is exactly what we've been doing at Sky Betting and Gaming. So, let's wrap this up then. Let's go back to those original goals. We said that we wanted to be the best login squad thing ever. And we were, because we were the only one. <laughs> we said that we wanted to be the most agile squad ever. And we were, because we defined our own version of agile. But we have a hunger to drive that forward and improve it. And we said we wanted to be maximum DevOps. And we became a DevOps team. It was no longer about just building a product, but it was about operating it and optimizing it going forward. So, my final two pieces of advice for you today are these. Don't copy us. <laughs> it sounds like a good story, but it's just a story. Don't try to be sky betting and gaming. Don't try to be the next Netflix. Don't aspire to be the next Amazon, because you are not them. The reason that they are successful is because they are not afraid to be themselves. If you want to be a high-performing team and build amazing products and services, be yourself. If you are yourself, you will do amazing things. Listen to the noise. Gather that data. Listen to your team. Sense and respond to the things and the signals that you see in that data. But always be yourself. Because when you are you, you will be, be amazing. You will build amazing products and you will have an amazing team. And that is the end of the show, and that was Lars. <laughs>